it's all there. A um, couple of photos. The bottom right hand corner, um, you should, if you're into paramedic science, recognize where that comes from. 24 hours in AE, probably one of the most realistic uh, medical series out there, as far as I'm concerned. And we've had a few lectures on there, much to their, uh, their horror, because we generally um, take the mick out of them for being on that show, because um, obviously they're here to teach and not become famous on the TV. Um, the degree, it's obviously it's a level six award, but it, it differs to a lot of other degrees in that it's very, very hands on. You're not going to be stuck in a lecture theatre for three years. Um, a lot of your time, you're going to be down in our simulation centre, learning the skills and learning the equipment um, that you need to need to know as a paramedic. Also, 50 percent of your time will be on placement, which is quite exciting. This is the degree. So level four, level five, level six or if you prefer, year one, year two, year three. Um, level four, year one is our basic year, um, because if you think about it, you're coming to join the course from a whole variety of different backgrounds, and we use our, our year one, our level four year, as our basic year to get you all up to the same sort of speed. Um, then perhaps worth mentioning in level five, year two, we have a mental health module. We were the first paramedic course in the country to have such a module, because these days now, Yes, it is the mental health of the patient, but it's also acknowledged that the mental health of the healthcare practitioner is also very, very important. Learning on the degree, we're going to teach you in all the usual ways that you'd expect. So there'll be large lecture theatre um, lectures, um, but we can't teach you all at the same time in, in the skill centre. So we split you down into smaller groups um, and you'll stay in that group then for the year, learning your skills and your simulation. We also have access to the anatomy lab and the pathology museum, um, thanks to um, being associated with the teaching hospital. Um, the pathology museum is amazing. They have thousands and thousands and thousands of preserved specimens of part of the human body. You get to see how a, um, a healthy organ um, goes, goes along the journey uh, through disease. It is fascinating. Plus you'll see, probably you'll probably see some Specimens in that you think, oh my goodness, there's no way that came out of a human body. Um, some of them are quite uh, interesting. Online learning via our VLE, our virtual learning environment, we use Canvas. Um, and we still see a place for online learning. Um, so some lectures will be delivered online, live, or perhaps pre-recorded. And as I mentioned, placement is a huge part of our degree, um, approximately um, 40 weeks for the total of the degree. But what we do, we split it all up throughout the year, so it's not just one massive placement block. For example, if you'd started in September, this September just gone, as a first year, you're going to be out um, on placement in the middle of November in a hospital ward. You come back to university, we teach you another bunch of stuff, and then you go out on placement Jan, January to March, which is your big placement on the back of an ambulance. And then in your second and third years, you have another placement at the end of the year as well. Um, the takeaway message from this slide is perhaps to note that um, the majority of um, our lecturing staff are practicing clinicians. So these are not just lecturers who've been doing it for years and years and years. These are um, clinicians who are still practicing today. Um, so when they're not teaching you, they're out doing shifts, keeping their skills and their knowledge up to date. Very, very important when you think about it. As and when we can, we will get guest lecturers in. Um, obviously, I mean, the example I always use is midwives because we have a really good um, relationship with the midwives over at Kingston. Um, why get a paramedic lecturer to teach you about helping people give birth and obstetrics? Well, we can get a midwife in. And basically, what they don't know about that subject is probably not worth knowing. Already mentioned placements. Every year, the big one is at the beginning of the year, Jan to March, on the back of an ambulance. But this gives you um, a flavour of the other types of clinical opportunities you will get on placement. Um, so by the time you've done, uh, you've finished your degree and you've hopefully successfully graduated, you'll have done um, something like eight or nine placements give, uh, across a whole variety of clinical opportunities, which gives you a really good insight as to perhaps where your paramedic career could go in the future. Um, when our degree was revalidated a couple of years ago, we were very, very highly commended on the student support that we give our students because um, I'll be honest up front, a paramedic degree is very, very hard, um, both mentally and physically. Um, it is a hard degree, but it might be a hard degree, but 
um, the rewards are huge once, once you start working in the profession. So as I mentioned, highly commended on the student support that we give our students. Um, we have a, uh, a one of our members of staff who is um, our pastoral lead, and they have a uh, mobile phone that's on um, daylight hours during the week, and you can give them a ring at any point. If you have any questions or you have any problems, you give them a ring. If they can't answer it, they can probably know the direction to point you in. We also have something called the Blue Light Champions. I think this is unique to us. Um, and this is a voluntary scheme for our third years. And we work with MIND, the mental health charity. And basically, they have a little bit of training course, and then um, they get a lovely blue polo shirt to wear. And they're there then to mentor the first and second years through the course. So if you think about it as a third year, you've been there, seen it, done it. Generally, this happens pre-exams. I'm not quite sure why. Um, we also have a senior lecturer who one of their primary uh, roles is academic support. Um, and basically, because we know for some people, um, academia is it, 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 maybe it's not their strong point. Um, and so we have a, a senior lecturer who has a whole wealth of experience in supporting people um, across academia. These are the things that we offer on our, especially on our course. But alongside that, you have everything that St. George's offers as well. And we always say the hardest thing to do is to put your hand up and say help. Once you do that, we will never leave you alone. I promise that. So we have a simulation centre. We're very, very proud of it. Um, back in 2015, I think we were the first paramedic course in the country um, to have such a centre. Unfortunately, now a lot of our competitors are catching up with us. But hey, so what can you expect to find in our simulation centre? Well, we have a skills lab. Um, this is where I say you start your journey off as a paramedic student, because this is where we start to teach you all those bits of kit that you need to know how to use the, as a paramedic and when to use it and where to use it. So basically where to stick things in people. Oh, and if you look at that bottom middle picture, we teach you a bit of bondage, not I mean fracture management as well. Once you've got the skills on board, we'll take you across to our simulation suite and it's one massive room. At one end of the room, we have two ambulances, the inside, the backs of ambulances, built to the same spec that London ambulances have out on the road today. The beauty of that is um, you get to do your simulation, your scenarios, your skills inside one of those ambulances. So when you go out on placement or in the future, you'll know where everything is. You've had that practice and it won't phase you out. You know where everything is, where everything is stored, the space you've got to move in, et cetera, et cetera. At the other end of the room, we have what we call our flat, our domicile rooms. So if you think about it, the rooms where, um, the most popular rooms in a house where accidents happen. So think about it as in a kitchen, probably a bedroom and a bathroom. Now, depending on the scenario, we can fill the rooms with appropriate props. So here we have two, um, two different scenarios, two different modules, but in the same uh, room, the kitchen. So on the left-hand side, we've got an elderly gentleman collapsed short of breath. Um, and I've caught that student brilliantly because he's thinking, oh, have I missed anything? Then on the right, again, um, same room, but a different scenario. This time, um, a little child thought it'd be great to cook his parents a meal. And unfortunately, they burned themselves. So we're trying to make our sim they're trying to make the, the scenarios as realistic as possible, but under safe simulated conditions. Oh, I need to update this now because it's now immersion rooms. We now have two immersion rooms. We have a little one and a large one. Um, and what, if you're not familiar with immersive technology, basically you walk in and to all effects, it's, it's a white room. But then through the wonders of technology, we can portray anything on the walls. So, for example, if you look at the left hand picture, it's a fire scenario. And we were very, very fortunate in that we captured, we were able to capture, well, we were able to get hold of the footage from the London riots that happened quite a few years ago. So um, what you have here is you walk into the scenario and you can your eyes can see the fire going on on the walls. Your ears can hear the crackling of the flames. And if we put a little bit of smoke in, it's like, yeah, I can smell it. And then we can control the temperature in the room. So if we boost the temperature up really, really hot, it's like you can actually feel. So basically, immersive, immersive technology is we're messing with your senses, really, at the end of the day. But oh, it's a... It's a there's a lot of research being done on how simulation, the benefits of simulation in, in terms of education. These, so, um, these what pictures you see in front of you, these scenarios are what we call low fidelity. So that's you and perhaps a crewmate interacting with a mannequin or a dummy in the scenario. We also do um, high fidelity simulations. So the chap on the left, as you can see, 
Um, he's a, a, a lower, an upper arm amputee. We've put a false arm on him and we've had a bit of fun with fake blood because what we're trying to do is trying to get you used to the scenarios that you might meet and experience out on the road. Pictures on the right um, are what we call moulage. I get told off because I just call it fancy makeup, but with a bit of fake blood, we can make the most gruesome of injuries amazing. Because if you look at that bottom, um, bottom right hand picture, you can see bite marks on a hand. And even without you realizing, your eyes are sending that information to your brain. It's like, oh my goodness, I can see, I can actually see the bite marks on that hand. We can do that just with a little bit of fake blood. It is amazing. Right, interagency training. As a paramedic, when you're out on the road, if you get called to a scene, a scenario, guaranteed you will interact with other members of the emergency services. So when we can get, when we can arrange these uh, training days, it's you getting familiar with how they work and they're getting familiar on how you work. For example, pictures on the left, obviously this was to do with fire and rescue, but it was all to do with patient extrication out of crashed vehicles. And that car apparently, I was told, had a roof on it at the beginning of the day. Um, and then the one on the right, as you can see, I don't think that student should be laughing so much as he bashes someone's front door down. But this was a, a police training day. And if you think about it, if you get called to um, a building or an environment where that door is locked, how are you going to access it? And so the police were showing our students that day what they do to access locked buildings. In your third year, um, we put you to the test in on a major, what we call our major tra trauma training day. Basically, we take the whole of the simulation center out into the real world somewhere. Um, for example, I think uh, last year we went to the local um, army training depot and we basically took that over for the week. And what you do as a third year student, um, you put all that knowledge, all that skills that you have into practice on the day. So there'll be a variety of patients in, in lots of different conditions and you, it's your job then to triage and to treat them. Alongside you, we also have members of, of the other emergency services and they treat it as a proper training day for themselves to see how their systems work. It's a fantastic day. And if you look at the second picture from the left, um, she hasn't really got a metal rod sticking out of her arm. That's the sort of injuries we can create with moulage. It is amazing. And we get the first and second years to help out as patients. And as you can see, our, our patient on the bottom right is enjoying herself lying down. But it's an am amazing week of scenarios. And our third year, the, the feedback we get from our students, our third year students, is how they enjoy it. And it sort of puts into perspective the three years that they've been learning about being a paramedic student. So <clears throat> where do we work? So think about if you come to St. George's, you're going to be working in London. So think about how amazing that would be to work in London, one of the most cosmopolitan capital cities in the world. Think about the numbers of people who come in London um, every day, you know, five days a week if, if, they're, if they're working. You've probably got about nine, 10 million people in London during the week. That's a lot of people, a lot of accidents waiting to happen. Think about the languages that are spoken, because guaranteed um, you're going to go, you will be called to a job where maybe English is not the first language. How are you going to cope with that? Um, excuse me, Google Translate. Joking, but you can see some, some of the uh, opportunities, some of the challenges you might have working in London. And no offence to people who might live in the Yorkshire Dales or the Scottish Highlands or the Outer Hebrides, lovely parts of the country, I'm sure. But what you will get to see and experience on one shift in London might take you perhaps a week, weeks to see anywhere else in the country. That's, that's the possibility of working in London. You think of the range of jobs that you might get. First job of the day, you might get called to an unconscious person. Um, second, second job of the day, it might be um, uh, uh, a transport um, accident somewhere. Third job of the day, you might be going to see that little old gentleman, that little old lady um, who hasn't seen anyone for days, just wants a cup of tea and a chat. That is one of the unwritten qualities that paramedic needs, actually. You need to be able to make a good cup of tea or coffee, because we're British, always makes everything good. So graduating. Um, we can, or I can almost say employability is almost 100% for our course within three to four months of graduating. The only reason why I can't say it's 100% is because some students stay in education, some students take a year out. That's the only reason why um, I can't hand on heart say 100%. So it, it's an exciting time to want to join the profession. 
Um, once you graduate, you are then eligible for registration with Health and Care Professions Council, the HCPC. That's our governing body. And you need to be registered with them to be able to practice as a paramedic. Starting salary, band five, approximately 25 and a half thousand pounds. Not a bad starting salary, but on top of that, think about adding overtime, unsocial hours, et cetera, et cetera. So you can boost that up to quite a decent salary once you start. And then for some of you, you want to give back to the university and to the course. So as alumni, you come back and you help us out on open days and skills days, et cetera, et cetera. Career opportunities. Um, gone are the days now when you tell someone, oh, I'm going to be a paramedic. And they go, oh, so you're going to drive an ambulance then? Yes, that is a small part of the job. But the career opportunities now for, for a paramedic graduate are becoming more extensive. There's, there are more and more different opportunities. And these are just some of the pictures um, highlighting some, some of the roles that you could perhaps find yourselves in um, a few years down the line. Um, that big red thing there, Air, London Air Ambulance Service, everyone wants to be on that. Um, considered the best air ambulance service in the world. Um, and if you get seconded onto that, and it's a very, very rigorous selection process, you are seen as a paramedic at the top of your game. It is very prestigious. And that lovely lady there um, uh, was one of our students, actually, and she now teaches on our post register. Um, we've also got three or four of the members of staff who've done secondment um, on the London Air Ambulance, on, on HEMS as well. Um, going to the left of her, or yeah, my left, looking at the screen. Um, the Andy Pandy suits, I get told off for pull on that, but the hazmat suits. Unfortunately, the last few years, we've seen them a bit more than we should have. So thank you, COVID. Um, going to the bottom right, um, 111, being a call handler in, one, in, in, on, in 111, the 111 service. Being able to picture um, what someone's trying to tell you and being able to give them advice over the phone is a, is a very big skill for some people comes naturally for other people they, they couldn't do it so that's again that's something worth considering being able to listen and give advice over the phone um depending on what the situation is 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 very very valuable um obviously ambulances there will be some ambulance and then yes i know um i challenge you to find me a paramedic who when they're driving on blue lights doesn't go ooh. but driving on blue lights is now a small part of the job man so don't think that's what you're gonna be doing all the time some of the time maybe Possibly think about grades. Well, we want five GCSEs at grade four or above. We must have um, English and maths and a science. And then three A-levels or the equivalent, one of which must be a science. Grades, treble B to B double C. Um, I won't go into all the qualification connotations that are available. If you are doing something different, I suggest please go to the website and you look at paramedic science. And there's a whole page of all the different qualifications um, that we take on our course. So um, once you've decided to apply via UCAS, um, if you meet um, or your predicted grades meet our criteria, we'll invite you to an interview. Um, that interview is what we um, it takes the process of what we call MMI, so multiple mini interviews. So gone are the day where you would sit in front of a big panel of um, interviewers, like a rabbit in headlights, those days are gone. So multiple mini interviews, as the name suggests, they're, they're, they're mini, mini interviews. So that you'll have five stations, Six questions, don't worry, the math does work. Um, and you have four minutes to answer every question at that, in, in those stations. Each station will ask you a different question. And what we're trying to do is tease out something of your character, of your personality. So by the time you've done those rounds of questions, we'll have a really good idea um, whether you're going to make a good paramedic or not. And in terms of bias, in terms of fairness, um, the interviewers know nothing about you until you sit down in front of you, in front of them, and you say, hello, my name is. That's all they know about you. So in terms of bias and fairness, it is brilliant. Um, if you're successful at interview, we will then offer you a place subject, obviously, to um, qualifications. Um, and then you also will have to do um, an occupational health clearance and a DBS check. If all those go OK, you are then on the course. Um, if you have any questions or queries going forward, there's some useful um, emails to, to take note of. Um, my one's the one in the middle, pjoyce.sgul.ac.uk. If you have any questions about coming on the course um, going forward, please um, don't hesitate to email me. I'm more than happy to answer every email I receive, but beware it does take, um, we do say three working days before, um, and if we haven't answered in three day, three working days, just because it's a 
just give us a little prompt. OK, right. Well, that's a very, very quick whirlwind guide to um, Paramedic Science at St. George's. And that's me now finished. I'm now going to stop sharing my screen um, and hand over to uh, Katie Pavoni. As I mentioned, she's our course director and she's going to talk to you about what a paramedic is. Thank you, Paul. I'm certainly going to try. I think I can see a hand up there. So I don't know whether or not there's a question that you want to put in the q and A. I think it's from Amy. Um, just while we're we're swapping screens, that might be helpful. So go for it, Amy. And I'm going to try and share my screen now. So, Paul, are you able to just tell me whether or not that can be seen? Yeah, I can see that very clearly. Lovely. Um, OK, so it's lovely to see you all. Um, for those of you that joined a little bit afterwards, I just wanted to say uh, I'm the course lead for paramedic science. It's lovely to be here with you for this very short sort of taster session uh, where you can ask some questions and hopefully get some more information about our program. So I'm very proud to say that I was a student at St George's many years ago um, and then came back to work uh, for St George's in 2015 and then uh, and now in the privileged position of being the course director. So I can very much say that I'm very proud of St George's as an institution and the programme that we offer. And um, I'm a, a clinical paramedic and I specialise in mental health. So for those of you that saw uh, that mentioned in Paul's presentation, I'm the person who then works um, in the mental health sector and the welfare lead for the programme, which to me is one of the most uh, important aspects of what I do, trying as a team uh, to look after you throughout your period of study here. So going to just talk to you a little bit about what it means to be a paramedic. So Paul has given us a lovely taster um, and flavour really of what it's about. But we're going to look at it in a little bit more detail and maybe unpick why you um, are interested in studying paramedic science here with us. So the role of the paramedic has changed quite significantly over the last uh, 30 to 40 years. And some of you who might be keen watches of things like ambulance, 24 hours in A&E, may be very familiar with it, or maybe you're even working in uh, 111 or within the NHS already. Um, but it would be great if I can open up a question for a question and answer, and maybe Kerry might be able to pop it in for me, about why some of you are interested in paramedic science. So why paramedic science? Um, and then we can unpick that further as we go through. So this is the bit of the history of paramedicine. So unlike our medical colleagues, our doctor colleagues, we are a relatively new profession. And actually, we didn't really come into existence or into our own until about 1970, which for many of you probably seems like a really, really long time ago. But it's actually not that long in the context of uh, other medical disciplines or healthcare disciplines. And in about 1985, we started to get more skills and we focused mainly on patient transportation, but we became uh, more um, embedded within the healthcare service and started to get more uh, things that we could do, more interventions that we could do. Only around about the turn of the year 2000 did we get a PIN number and become a registered profession, which is really, really important um, for for us, but also for patient safety. So we became accountable as paramedics. You're given a unique registration number that you are given when you qualify um, and you're regulated or we're a regulated body, which means that we have uh, external governance to kind of um, contain what we can do. And then since around about the early 2000s, um, we started to develop into more specialist practice. So some of our lecturers, um, as we said, are alumni, are graduates from this programme. Some of them were actually some of the first paramedics to be registered in the UK. Um, so we're, we're very proud of the diversity um, within our team in terms of clinical practice and how uh, the people have contributed to the, to the profession in different ways. So I was showing this to some of our third years today. This is the journey that we've been on. So this is the equivalent from 1974 of ambulance that you see on BBC now that's really popular and features lots and lots of our not just lecturers, but graduates as well. So uh, the original documentary was called The Men in the Ambulance. And as you'll be pleased to know, as I certainly am, lots of things have changed there and they've they've. Uh, let more than just people identifying as men into the ambulance service as well. And we did sadly get rid of the hats and the ties, as you would know um, from uh, you and be pleased to know, probably. So a bit more about what we uh, did in terms of our professional journey. 
of achieved. We have a professional body called the College of Paramedics that many of you uh, will probably have heard of, where you can have a student membership before you become registered. We've had a uh, really big regulation in terms of what we teach and our program is endorsed by the College of Paramedics. So that is a, a gold seal of approval from our professional body for the program that we do. We've also got these specialist practice roles that we've been speaking about as well, and lots and lots of opportunities after undergraduate study to um, develop your skills. That can be in prescribing or it can be in advanced clinical practice as well. So we've achieved a lot in a very, very short period of time. So this is probably what you're more familiar with in terms of uh, representation of Amnet's documentaries. Um, and our skills and interventions that we can do have also grown massively. So that is a photo taken of all of the kits, by the way, on the right hand side there with two paramedics lying on the floor next to everything that's contained within the ambulance service. So we've gone a very long way from uh, the stretchers and hats that you would have seen in that 1974 clip there. OK, so what's it like being a paramedic? Well, um, it's very, very, very um, varied. And it's what I would suggest is predictably unpredictable. So we never know what we're going to walk into and it can change, as Paul says, uh, quite exponentially between calls. So we go from delivering babies to supporting people in mental health crisis, trauma care, social emergencies, all within one 12 hour shift. So we tend to work uh, across the week so we and across the 24 hour clock. So day shifts, late shifts and night shifts and generally speaking, um, as a paramedic, you'll be working in a double crewed ambulance. But for you as a student, you will always be the third person. So what we call supernumerary. So you're not expected to work um, as a, a crew yet within that um, within that uh, sector. So you will only ever be working alongside a mentor, which I'm pretty sure you'll be pleased to know. So what a paramedic is, because this is something that actually has been up for debate quite a lot. But essentially what we say is we're autonomous, so meaning we can make independent decisions. We have a knowledge, skills and clinical expertise that assess, treat, diagnose, supply and administer medicines, manage, discharge and refer patients. OK, so a lot of things that we do across the interaction in urgent, emergency, critical and out of hospital settings, which basically means we do everything across the entire patient interaction, which means we require an awful lot of skill in which to do that. So we haven't always been represented fairly, um, and some of our students today were smiling about that because actually it's very contentious. We have been called um, many times, and very, even very recently by Jeremy Hunt as ambulance drivers. That's certainly not what we are anymore. Very highly skilled practitioners who work in a variety of very unpredictable environments. So like I said, we gained a PIN number, we gained professional registration. This is really key to what we do here as a, as a paramedic profession. So we have a duty of care that we give to our patients. We have standards of conduct and ethics, and these are in place to protect the public, okay, and our patients. So what we do um, is regulated and our actions matter. So we're, we're, it's a lot of responsibility being a paramedic, but it is absolutely the best job in the world. So a couple of uh, points about roles and responsibilities of being a paramedic before I come to you, hopefully some Q&A answers. So what we do is we look at physical health and psychosocial health. OK, so mental health is just as important as physical health. We're very, very passionate about that here at St George's. Um, so we will look at that in terms of all of these different bullet points that are on the screen, physical health and mental health. So we look at preparation. We look at response. We look at scene assessment. We look at um, patient assessment and the recognition of injury and illness across the lifespan. So that's adult, uh, older adult, child, uh, etc., adolescent and newborn. We look at ethical, legal and professional challenges. Uh, so how we make decisions, how we make professional decisions um, and how we apply those within our practice are very important. So we do have to have a good understanding of things like the Mental Health Act, the Mental Capacity Act, um, etc., which will go, you will learn in great depth across the degree. We look at how to evaluate evidence and critique it. So use research to influence practice. 
and also challenge research that we don't think is actually that applicable to our profession. We look at making sure patients get the right care at the right time. Clearly, there is an element of transfer sometimes, and also making sure that what we do, we are accountable to by keeping good records. So there's a lot to it, OK? An awful lot to it. And I'm sure that that um, is something that you, you're aware of or maybe it gave you the flavour for wanting to, to come and study with us. So what are the main skills that we have? Top of the list always, if you ask any member of this team, will be empathy and compassion. OK, good paramedics are not known because of their ability to put a needle in somebody's arm. But they're known for being nice people, showing empathy and compassion, sometimes in what is the hardest um, experience a person will have in their life. With, we need to be good communicators. We need to be good at making clinical decisions, OK, and making those decisions under pressure, sometimes in the rain, sometimes in loud environments where it's not easy to do. Um, we have critical care skills, so we can read electrocardiograph traces of the heart and interpret them to make a decision of what to do for the patient. We uh, are trained in advanced life support, so resuscitation, cannulation, uh, so that is uh, the putting the needles in people's arms to give medicines, and intraosseous, which is uh, what you see in that um, bottom right-hand corner that looks like a little gun. That is how we drill into the bone to give medicines and fluids sometimes where we can't get um, access to the vein. We use a mobilisation, which is, again, what you might be familiar with if you've seen it before, to stabilise somebody's head and neck if they've been involved in a traumatic incident, trauma care and bleeding control. And that's before we move on to minor health. So we can manage minor health and minor injuries. I've mentioned mental health uh, and as We've mentioned it a few times and so because it is very, very important to us. And as paramedics, we can give over 40 medicines, OK, which is actually pretty significant when you compare us to other professions. We work a lot with other professions um, and we need to in, in a way that is beneficial for the patient. So we are very, very key often between the patient at home and then the care that they receive in follow up as well. And we do a lot of social and welfare support for, for people um, when they're in need. So uh, other skills that we have as paramedics, so we have to be adaptable. We have to adapt to some significant challenges that happen um, within our communities. So one of the most noticeable being COVID. So us on the front line were the people that when everybody was staying at home and were quite rightly very frightened. Our uh, colleagues and our paramedic um, family, a wider green family, were going into danger, into the face of danger. We're there to promote health, to help people access help and enable, empower them to live well. And we're there to try and expand our knowledge as a profession. OK, but more so than anything else, our skills are about looking after ourselves because we can't look after anybody else unless we do that and never ever to stop learning. OK, so the day a paramedic feels they know everything is the day that there's a worry, to be honest. So there's always an expectation that we keep training, we keep learning and keep doing the best for the patient. So where are we going next? Well, Paul has mentioned a few already, but you might see paramedics working in uh, um, A&E. So you might have seen them already in critical care in GP surgeries in other settings within the community. We have lots of paramedics working in research to try and enhance our knowledge and understanding in different areas. Lots of us working in education. So like Paul mentioned, lots of our team are education specialists. We have specialist roles such as the air ambulance uh, working in uh, the NHS 111 um, and in other kind of specific areas of practice as well. And uh, you will see some staff working in um, really non-traditional environments like prisons and in remote medicine as well. So we have come a long way and we are our journey ahead is really quite exciting, which you're going to be part of. So I think um, we may have some questions that people want to ask, but I'm going to pause there and just see whether or not there are any in the Q&A. And I can't quite hear you at the moment, Kerry, but that might be me. Sorry, I, <laughs> classic. Um, I posted in the Q&A, but I'm worried that people can't see it. So we have turned the chat on just in case that's easier for people to access. So um, if you would like to share just a very brief 
insight into why you want to why you're considering becoming a paramedic that would be so lovely to hear um the other thing as well if you've got any other questions or um just anything that you wanted to kind of ask either our staff or our students um please do post um we will be monitoring both the q a and the chat at this point and just to make sure that we can hear from everyone should they have any questions um i think what we'll do just because we don't have any at the moment we'll move on to hearing from our students and learn a bit about their experience and then um hopefully we'll have a few questions when we finish that um so you might um we'll bring our students on the screen in a minute but um we will hear a bit about their experience and we really encourage you to ask them questions um particularly about how they found the course um because it's probably much better to get real life experience from someone doing it now um and i'm sure our academic colleagues would agree that it's it's better to ask the students because they're living it um so what i'll do is I will bring Zainab. There we go. Zainab's on the screen. So we'll hear from you first. And then um, once we've heard from Zainab, then we uh, will hear from, crikey, Amber, I think. Sorry. Um, so, <clears throat> excuse me. So Zainab, um, do you want to just tell us a bit about your experience of studying at St George's, studying as a paramedic um, and anything else that you think is important to share with our prospective students? Um, hi guys, I'm Zainab, second year student paramedic. Um, so I chose the course because after my A-levels, I think I was quite unsure of what I wanted to do. I, I was always slightly guided that I knew I wanted to um, go down kind of like a healthcare realm, if that makes sense. But I started like actively attending webinars and open days. Um, and then what attracted me, what attracted me to St George's was that it was interesting because there was a mix of practical simulations and then a lecture. So using what you learn in lectures and then integrating the skills and scenarios, it's just really like rewarding for me and quite fulfilling to see like the progression you make throughout and like learning even even within the real world application as well. So I think that was really good. I like the skill set that you kind of gained throughout first year and I'm in second year now. I particularly enjoyed the skill sessions. Um, it's very supportive, very immersive, um, and it's very confidence building as well because you start to engage with peers. And for me, I think I was quite shy before, but I've definitely kind of gained that communication skills and that interpersonal skill that you definitely need to become a paramedic. Um, so teamwork with your peers and colleagues to meet like a goal, so, so fun. And then once you've completed, say, a scenario or a simulation, discussing it with the lecturers, the negatives and like learning from it. And they have such an amazing skill set as well. Super friendly and they can fill in the gaps that maybe the textbooks won't teach you. Um, and there is an element of commitment required. Um, you do have to have that independence to do pre-reading and like making sure that you're attending lectures, because at the end of the day, this skill set is kind of really needed to ensure you're giving the best help to people. Um, and especially with placement, definitely learned to um, balance my work relationships and that social life and commuting into uni also ta um, taught me to have a routine. And just generally like Tooting is such a multicultural little place. I really enjoy it. Um, commuting's not too hard as well. Um, the train station's nearby and the society's available as well. It's really good, um, especially the sporting societies. It's so good. So yeah, that's what I'd say. Thank you, Zainab. I'm also just going to ask you a question, just because I think it might be helpful for people on the call, and I'll ask Amber in a minute. Um, how did you find? I don't know what you came to this course from. I miss, was it a school that you came from into paramedic science course? How did you find that transition? So I did my A-levels, um, I did psychology, biology and English literature and I'd say having that biology aspect was helpful because you do have to know a bit of your pathophysiology and just general bodily structures I'd say, um, but just generally it is a jump 
but the support that's available in St George's I'd say access the support because you've got the academic support centres you've got the librarians who are amazing with um, referencing and it can be daunting at first but some people are all in the same boat so you're not alone and the support available at St George's is actually insane like it's super helpful especially the academic life centre booking sessions in and also counselling services if it is getting tough it's always there for you. Brilliant thank you so much so much Dana for sharing and um, I'll invite Amber on. Hi Amber. Hello. Um, lovely to have you if it would be great if we could just hear about a bit about your experience as well um and anything that you think would be really helpful for our prospective students to know about the course so i have written some stuff down so if i'm like looking at my phone it's because i'm reading i feel like there's a lot to lot to say about um uni to be fair so the reason i chose paramedic science was mainly because it's like not your usual nine to five working environment I like a good fast paced um, environment where I can sort of like be out and not be stuck in an office all day. Um, it's not like you're boring nine to five. It's some crazy 12 hour shifts. Um, but all the mentors, I mean, I work out of Croydon, so all the mentors are pretty good. They, um, they're really supportive and they bring lots of snacks onto shift, which makes it so much better. Um, for me coming into third year, you know, I've got to start thinking about my career choices and where I want to go um so at the moment I work as a healthcare assistant in Brixton prison which is crazy it's busy you get call outs but the experience I've got from that is is mad like I've got so much more knowledge about little things and when I go out onto the road I can implement that into my time on the road um also you meet a lot of people from a lot of walks of life. There's a lot of people in London and in Croydon where I am based. And they all have a story and I just love that. It's just so cool. Um, social life wise, at the moment, I do not have a social life. I am inundated with exams coming up, um, my dissertation that I have to write and I am just staying at home. I'm not really going out, but in first and second year, I was only at uni three days a week, so I do Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So Saturday, Sunday, Monday and Tuesday, I use that time to go out, be with my friends, go and see my family back home um, and go to work. So I did try, but third year, I'm not trying. I'm not going out. I will stick to revising. <laughs> um, so I've not had the conventional uni lifestyle, if that makes sense. So I never went to halls um I went straight to living with my partner and we still live together so I've not really had that you know uni life um I prefer it like that because I'm what they consider a mature student um so I didn't really want to be living in halls with you know younger people um I just sort of wanted to be on my own with my partner which was quite nice um yeah I mean public transport is phenomenal around here like if you ever need to get to placement or if you commute to uni there's buses there's trams there's tubes I yeah I wouldn't I would always pick London over anywhere else um because as I think Paul Joyce said at the beginning everywhere else is really boring compared to London um my friends work in CCAM and they have definitely not had the experience that I've had with some of my jobs on the road <laughs> but yeah that's it really I think I dipped into other unis where I had interviews um but I did accept St George's primarily because of 24 hours in NA I thought that was a really cool thing to say I go to the same uni where they film 24 hours in NA um but yeah that's it I think I don't really think there's anything else great right, thank you Amber and can I ask um you you came in as a mature student so did you come from what kind of settings did you come from into this program so I took a gap year that turned into a five year gap year. Um, I So when I was 17, I went straight into a &E as a healthcare assistant back home in Kent. And um, I worked there for four and a half years before I decided that I wanted, wanted to come to uni. It was never my choice. I never really wanted to come um, because I hated living away from home. I hated going out. I just 
didn't like to be very sociable. Um, so I went and had a chat with my local ambulance station and they said, look, the best way to do it is to get some experience from somewhere, whether that be like call centres or A&E or wherever, if you don't want to go to uni. Um, after four years of A&E, one of the nurses said to me, you need to go and do it because your life is not here. Your life is in London. And that same night I applied and I got in. So, yeah. Great. Thank you for sharing. Um, <laughs> fabulous. So if I could just invite Paul and Zaina back, that would be great. Um, we do have a few questions. Um, so we had um, one question. This is in the Q&A and then I'll move to the chat because that's where most of the activity is. Um, so I think this is for our students. There's a question from Jess. What, what part of the course have you found the most challenging so far? I'll ask Zainab first and then Hamba. I think so far for me, the most challenging has to be a mix of essay writing right now because academic writing is tough, but you do have your support. Um, but also I would say the confidence as well. Gaining that confidence on placement for me was tough. Um, but you're supported by mentors as well. You've got your allocated mentors and you can talk to lecturers at all times. So. I would say even if there was a struggle, there's always a way to combat that. So, yeah. Um, I think for me, it's probably the workload. I'm not a very organised person. I'd say I try to be, but trying and doing is two completely different things. Um, so I think the workload and trying to balance sort of every aspect of uni life going to see family having a job and doing uni and placement is quite tough but and it can be challenging at times I think I've probably cried to Katie about 50 times in the three years that I've been at uni um but it does work if you plan your time it works really well so I think that was probably the most challenging thing also, also it's very interesting because as admissions tutor I see applicants on open days i see them when they come for the mmi and they're scared they're scared you know doing the mmis i see see them when they start on day one week one year one and i always say and probably zainab and, and we'll remember this i always say so that on day one and week one year one remember this day because these three years can go so so quickly they go by in a flash and it's also interesting as zainab has said when she started she wouldn't have said boo to a goose she was so quiet uh, and <laughs> And over the three years, you see the students gain that confidence um, to basically talk, talk to anyone, um, experience anything, do anything, because they're, of the, what we set up in terms of supporting the students throughout the course, as both Amber and Zeneb said, you, can, you, talk, you talk to any member of staff about anything, and um, we're always there. We're always willing to have a chat in the corridor, in the lecture theatre, after lectures, after sim. We're always around and we're always happy to chat and give you the support that we want. Because at the end of the day, once you join the course, our job is to get you to graduate. That's what we're there for. And hopefully see you as the ambulance goes past. I can say, oh, look, there's one of my stu ex-students. That's what I love to do. Brill, thank you, everyone. Um, so just looking at more of the questions. So um, a question here that says, you said working alongside a mentor. Um, would that be during the course or after the completion of the course? I suppose, Paul or Katie, what is what is the mentor and what context is that in? Yeah, I don't mind picking that one up. So we call them a mentor or practice educator. So when you're working as a student, you'll always have a practice educator with you. When you qualify, you're normally then there'll be a bit of an induction, but then you'll be out doing it by yourself. So when you're with us, you'll always have a net practice educator. You won't be doing it by yourself. But when you qualify, then that's the exciting bit, but also the scary bit. And that's why Amber flinched then, because she's getting nearer doing it by herself. But she's going to be absolutely ready to do it. Um, as are all our third years, get a little bit worried as you approach this time. But we get you ready to absolutely be brilliant at it. OK, so you have the mentor with us and then afterwards you fly the nest and you do it by yourself. And you'll be fine. It's it's probably worth mentioning as well. The mentor is when you're on placement. Um, when you're at uni when you're at university um, for the three years, you will have a personal tutor. 
who is there to help you re regarding anything while you're on the course. Great, thank you, uh, Katie and Paul. Um, the next question, I'm just aware of time and I don't want to miss anything. So there was a question, I don't understand this, but I'm hoping one of you will. Do you offer any additional courses alongside the degree like ACELS? Is that advanced critical life support? Or um, we don't, we, no, no, you've put it down on the advanced <laughs> <laughs> life support. Yeah, we, we don't offer um, those st statutory courses certificated through the programme because the programme is intense enough and I'm sure Zainab and Amber will say that so there's no there are opportunities to do other things within the university but for us the program is quite big quite complex and those things are taught to the standard of the courses but you don't have a standalone CPD course within it it would be too much I think it would be um, unkind to put you through additional courses as well but there are other opportunities um, within the wider uh, universities so you can you can work with you know if there's a course being offered by medicine or physio then they will often be university wide for students to go to but but no we don't and I suppose as well those are those are opportunities that you will get once you're possibly qualified um, with your ambulance service as well um, as development right so um, probably a nice thing to leave them until you've qualified if the course is as busy as, as uh, you're all saying <laughs> Um, there's a question here about the difference between like the degree route and the apprenticeship route um, said so a mix of practical and lectures. Um, so what would be the difference between applying for like the degree route that we offer versus an apprenticeship route? Um, if you want, there's a bit more to the question, it might be worth having a read. Um, and there's also a question relating to kind of subject specific requirements that might be best um, to email about. Um, just looking at time. Yeah, I don't mind picking up the bit about the apprenticeship. So when you apply through an apprenticeship route, you're employed by the ambulance service as an employee, and then you would work without, um, you'd be working in a two rather than a three. So with us, you are always in a student capacity for those three years. We are, you're not a member of the ambulance service until you are employed by them. So you have all the fun, uh, the access to the university services that we teach you. We also teach you a national program for rather than a trust specific program. So you can work anywhere in the UK after finishing our degree. So we, although we have a big affiliation with London and the surrounding trusts, you can literally go back to the Outer Hebrides if that's where you've come come from. So uh, for in terms of the difference, it's about you are a university student with all the support, personal tutoring, all those elements that you wouldn't get having to work a full time rotor for the ambulance service. So you would be doing your degree study on top of a full time job. And that's the difference with us. You do your full time placement built into the programme. So apprenticeships are, are very difficult in a different way. So we're we're a bit biased because of the programme that we offer, but we we it gives you the space to learn and um, without the pressure of actually being employed at the same time. Great, thank you, Katie. Just, also, sorry, can I caveat this? Yeah, as well? go ahead. So when I'm on station on placement shifts, every single person that does the apprenticeship moans. They when they're working, there's, they have to request annual leave to be able to go to uni, do their exams, attend lectures, and they have to request that annual leave. So it's not like they're getting paid for it. Um, and then on top of that, you are doing 12 hour shifts at a time. It's not it's 12 hours and then maybe a uni day, then another 12 hours. Whereas like uni is block, 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 which is nice because then you're not you're not thinking about uni when you're on placement but whereas when you do the apprenticeship there's it's like week in week out is like shift uni shift uni it it's non-stop I mean I think the only positive that I've ever heard is that they get paid that's probably it but yeah all I've heard is poor things from the apprenticeship and it was something that I considered doing but I'd never never say that I'd ever consider it ever again I suppose it's something that we would encourage you to research mm, and you 
you as a prospective student for wanting to go into this profession and knowing that the route to get there is to do a paramedic science degree and um, the best thing for you to do is kind of do all the research you can speak to as many people as you can who've kind of encountered both um like each setting um and knowing yourself and the kind of environments that you would probably cope well with making an informed decision about that um everyone is different um and you know different routes exist for different reasons um obviously we think our course is brilliant but we also know that there are other reasons to to pursue an apprenticeship route as well so um we would encourage you if you're considering an apprenticeship route to really just take that that decision um just make make a very careful decision about it um as we would for anyone pursuing any course at higher education it's a big decision to make um and the format of the delivery of that qualification is just as important um great i'm very aware of the time there's a couple of questions um we will continue answering the questions beyond five but we appreciate that people might need to go at five um we'll just be here for a few more minutes and that's it um but if you do need to leave then this session is being recorded and it will be made available online um but just very quickly there's i think just one more question actually um just question about course structure um so what's the mixture of lectures clinical teaching and placement and how so the, the question was about you know is it is year one more academic and then just like clinical build and you get more independent as you go um could you just summarize quickly i can do um, very quickly that, yes yeah <laughs> each year each year is a third theory a third practical sim and a third of placement you do placement every year every single year you have a mentor okay so that doesn't change at any point what changes is the level of knowledge you have at those different levels so you when you're going into placement in year three you will be uh, assessed in practice at, by a mentor but at a different level than obviously in year one so every year has a third of each theory practical simulation and placement okay and you will always be with a mentor for the duration of the whole three years you're with us so hopefully that summarises it <laughs> enough. But, yeah, I uh, think that's perfectly summarised, Katie. Thank you very much. Um, well, I think what we'll do, I'm just going to double check if there's anything else. Um, I think that's all the questions. Um, thank you for sharing some of a couple of you answered the asked Katie's question earlier about why do you want to get into paramedic science thank you so much for sharing that um, lovely to read thank you so much for joining us um, today for this event it's been great um, being able to interact with you and, and see the kind of questions and concerns that you have and um, thank you to all of our presenters uh, Paul, Katie, Zainab and Amber um, if you do have any questions um, following this event um, we do have a contact us page on our website, which has all of the information on who to contact about what. Um, and the other thing that we are running at the moment is campus tours. So um, if you just go onto our website and search campus tours, if you want to come to site and have a look around, um, do book onto one of those if you can, um, because it's really worth seeing our site it's very different to a normal standard kind of campus-based university um, and it's such a brilliant immersive atmosphere and um, so thank you very much and we'll wish you all a lovely evening <laughs>